Good afternoon and welcome to Across the Arts. I'm your host, Patrick D. McCoy. I am delighted to be joined today by a very special artist who will be coming to the DC area to make her debut with the Washington Bach Consort in Heightens Creation. Praised by the Washington Post as a fine young soprano with a lovely voice, possessing a graceful tonal clarity that is a wonder to hear by the San Francisco Chronicle. Soprano Michelle Kennedy is a versatile specialist in early and new music. Her recent concert views include Carnegie Hall, Davies Symphony Hall, Getty Museum, Lincoln Center, and the Washington National Cathedral. Michelle has been a featured soloist in Box St. Matthew Passion with the San Francisco Symphony Chorus and Voices of Music, Handles the Messiah with Trinity Wall Street Choir, Pooh Lakes Gloria with the Box Society of St. Louis, Undies with Moore's Oratorial Scenes from the Life of a Martyr at UC Berkeley, and the list goes on and on. I could just continue to read all about Michelle's accolades, but at this time, please join me and welcoming acclaimed soprano, Michelle Kennedy. Hello, Patrick. Oh my goodness, Michelle. It is so <laughs> good to see you. Thank you so much for being a guest on Across the Arts today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Patrick. Thank you for inviting me. It's so good oh my to see goodness. you. Oh my goodness. And likewise. <laughs> Listen, we go way back. I was actually, you know, going through my files and I found that picture uh, that was taken of us after your performance with the Folger Consort. And it was such a fun moment. I think that was 2012. <laughs> so we yes. have some history. And, and I believe the last time I saw you was actually in your performance um, with the 13 and in Monte Verdi's uh, Vespers. So I, I, I just can't speak enough of, of how thrilled I am to be with you tonight on this broadcast. Oh, thank and I you, hope Patrick. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So let's, let's just jump right in. So Michelle, I always like to do these interviews from the standpoint that there may be someone on here, they don't know a thing about classical music. They don't know about the artists. So let's jump in just for the beginning. Tell me, tell me a little bit about your background and how you were introduced to music. Yes, of course. I think the first memory I have of enjoying listening to music was from age two. <laughs> my grandfather, my mother's father, he would play Bach every morning, Patrick. Just It was like his meditation. So he would sit at his keyboard and he would play some chestnuts like Ode to Joy and, you know, familiar favorites. And then he would just kind of riff on his favorite Bach. And he noticed, being the sensitive man that he was, he noticed that his granddaughter was really listening. And he, when I was three years old, he gave my family an upright Yamaha piano. And he said, you know what? Michelle has an ear. Let's see what she thinks about this piano. So when I first started lessons, I was so tiny, Patrick. My feet didn't even touch the ground. <laughs> shy I would just bury myself in that piano for hours but that was really my gateway to music Suzuki piano as a tiny tiny kid and I think it was actually a wonderful entry especially for a shy kid because Suzuki is so hands-on and it's all about listening to your senses and kind of getting lost in the world of your imagination at the instrument and that worked really well for me <laughs> and then I'll tell you by the time I was seven my parents say, when I was supposed to be practicing piano, I would start to sing. Mm -hmm. And it, it began with, you know, the, the early favorites like Red River Valley and Dona Nobis Pacham. And then eventually my parents were like, Michelle is not playing the piano when she's supposed to practice. She's singing. <laughs> So let's try out a choir. They had me audition for a couple of different Bay Area music groups. And I ended up in the San Francisco Girls Chorus, which was like second family and still is. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, I, I <laughs> found that picture today of Did you? in the Girls Chorus. And, and something told me I should have downloaded it so I could have I've shared. It's so adorable. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but so... So, you know, in this music profession, a lot of times 
um, you know, some people are blessed to have a supportive family, which is it sounds like you did. Um, and others, like when you're pursuing like a career, they'll say, oh, well, you know, if you be a musician, you got to you got to find a real career. You got to find a real job to fall back on. How did you know, um, I guess, beyond the Suzuki? OK, you found your voice. Mm -hmm. How did you know, hey, this is going to be, you know, my wheelhouse. This is going to be my my main thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the girls chorus was the big gateway, honestly, Patrick, and my whole family was involved. You know, it would just be my sister, my parents, every concert. My dad was on the board of the San Francisco girls chorus for years. I, I felt so, I felt so supported and I felt so seen there. Mm -hmm. And when I first joined, you know, seven years old, I was too shy to look up at the conductor. I, I needed I needed some development. And I think by the time I was 12, 13, we were performing everywhere, SF Opera, and we'd go on tour. We went on tour overseas. We performed at Davies Symphony Hall every year, which the Girls' Chorus still does as an annual tradition. And I've since joined them as an alum, a guest soloist and a master class director. And I think it was really those early roots and the intensity of the Girls' Chorus training that planted the seed. And I thought, you know, maybe I could do this for real. <laughs> but I think it wasn't until I came to college and found some new mentors and some new voice teachers who could really prepare me for young adulthood in the profession that it started to crystallize as a, a real thing that might actually be able to happen. <laughs> mm. Let's talk a little bit about college because, you know, of course, you know, I'm, I'm reading your bio and a lot of times I know people don't talk about the, the academia per se about as far as credentials, but I saw, I was mm. like, get it, girl. I said, I said, I said, I said Yale and, and New York <laughs> University. Talk to me about, I guess, um, a, as a student, like the mm. rigor of those programs for somebody, it might be mm. someone who they say, hey, I want to, you know, be a music major. I might want to have another experience. Talk to a little bit about the rigor of those programs. Mm. <laughs> they demanded a lot of us, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> they are not for the faint, let me tell you. And when I, when I came into college, I had two interests, which I ended up pursuing as a double major. So one of my majors was music and the other one was political science. So I always was very interested in musical study and social justice issues, issues of equity. And uh, I, at first I thought of them actually as very separate. So I would go to my political science classes, go to my music classes, and I was taking music history, music theory, uh, sight singing, composition, everything. And for me, that was um, the music history element was totally new. Uh, Aside from what I had learned in the girls' chorus, you know, performing Vivaldi and uh, a number of other historic composers, I it was new to me to be steeped in all of those that sort of interdisciplinary lens on music, mm -hmm. uh, and it was very rigorous. I spent many many hours at the Yale Music Library, and I had my study buddies, and we would work together. But I think for me, uh, this profound evolution happened over the course of my four years as an undergrad. I think I went in thinking of my musical and political interests as totally separate. And then over the course of those four years, I actually realized more and more that they're very connected. And mm -hmm. I think that that is quite at play in my career today. And it has to do with several key mentors of mine in college. Uh, my, my mentor from Christchurch, New Haven, Robert Lehman, who is still a very beloved friend in my life. Uh, my, my teacher, Lily Chikazian at the Yale School of Music. Uh, they would let undergrads study, study voice at the graduate level if, if you auditioned into that. Mm -hmm. And oh, Patrick, it was so, it was so intimidating <laughs> to me at first. Let me tell you, my first lesson with Lily Chikese and I was like shaking in my boots, but she was so good for me. And she spoke a very real talk to me about the profession, you know, the romance languages, getting my, you know, business acumen, those skills ready. Uh, she knew I wanted to move to New York after I graduated and she she helped me prepare. You know, it is it's interesting that you mentioned the 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 two sides of yourself coming together, you know, the, the political science sort of stuff and the music and how you thought they were separate. But I'm sure that when the pandemic happened, 
and George Floyd and all of this, this um, you know, the discussions of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm sure mm -hmm. all of that kind of came uh, to the fore and you literally uh, use your voice, you know, to champion those issues. So, you know, on behalf of all of us, I just want to say thank you to you, um, you know, because so many people, you know, during that time, you know, um, you know, they, they spoke out and, and they suffered or they probably thought, oh my gosh, am I going to have a career out there if I say this or that? But, you know, I think it takes great courage. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Now, move, now, move, now, oh, I want to get you all missed that. You know? <laughs> it's not hard to do. It's not hard to do, so, Patrick. <laughs> so listen, I know we've been, we've been talking enough, but I want to give uh, give the audience a little uh, taste. I, I was so glad that you sent me some things. And of course, everybody, I have my recording that Michelle, oh, it's, it's fuzzy now. I forgot. Oh, I have it too. Oh, good, good. Agave. You, Agave. We're going to get to that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you for sending me some some various clips so people can get the full, you know, breadth of, of what you do. And when we say early music and, you know, your recording. But I first want to play and I'm going to give a disclaimer. Um, and I hope, I oh. hope to think, <laughs> you know, when you sent me, you sent me the recordings, you know, the one that jumped out at me, of course, was Let the Seraphim. Oh, yes. Uh, because and I, maybe I ask you this after the fact, but I, it was a delight treat because that's one of those pieces that I I tend not to listen to somebody else say because I already have somebody else already. Yes, in my yes, I know. So I just said, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, just said, I said, let me click on this thing, and it was a delightful treat. It truly oh, was. Thank so you. I am going to see if I can share that. You know, that's one thing about this pandemic too. You doing these virtual things, you have to share all these screens. <laughs> and you would think that we've got better, but I still you would fumble. think. <laughs> so let me see. Let's see. Wonderful. Hopefully I can uh that doesn't look right. Hold on. If you all just be patient, I'll just try to talk while we're doing this. <laughs> uh there it is it's right there you got the link yeah so let me i love see. singing this aria patrick i love practicing this aria i love the storytelling behind this aria it's just a joy all right so let me i think i think i got it now hopefully you Wonderful. all are here Harris Teeter now offers a new way to have your groceries delivered. Select Harris Teeter Delivery when you order on HarrisTeeter.com or our app. Your groceries are delivered in a refrigerated truck by a Harris Teeter driver. That way, you'll know when your order arrives that your fresh and frozen you food stays temperature controlled and handled with care. Save $25 off your first two Harris Teeter delivery orders of $50 or more. Go to HarrisTeeter.com. They gave us a full... Oh my goodness. Let's stop this one. <laughs> well, well, shout out to Harris Taylor. Maybe they will endorse across Maybe the they'll endorse us. Well, I, I have to tell you, Patrick, that that was my first time performing with Portland Baroque Orchestra with that aria. And it was conducted by one Dana Marsh, mm. who is a total delight to work with on every level. It was such an honor. How should we try again? Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> Oh god! I don't know where that ad came from. Maybe, maybe it wasn't meant for me to play. It was not meant to be. Let me see. We can That's share it as a follow up. Do it, do it. <laughs> yes. So, so let's. So, so uh, audience, I'm so sorry. One of these days, I'll get me uh, a little tech person to be in the background and do all these. Uh, <laughs> I'm oh, glad it's not just me, Patrick. Everything. Playing everything. It's playing everything but what I want it to play. I had all this stuff set up, but anyway, we'll the we'll, we'll the best laid out. plans. It happens to us all, Patrick. Anyway, so so you before before my little technical snafu, I was uh 
trying to break forth the fact that Michelle sent me several clips to play and I had them all lined up. And one of the clips was uh, the aria, Let the Bright Seraphim by Handel. And I was saying how, you know, sometimes when you listen to certain singers, you have different voices in your ear, but this recording she sent me, it was such a delightful uh, treat. And so then she also just segued into the fact that when she performed it, it was with none other than Dana Marsh, who we know here in the D.C. area as the artistic director of the Washington Bot Consort. So, Michelle, tell me a little bit about your experience working with Dana and when you perform this particular aria. Oh, I remember when I first entered the church for our, our first rehearsal of the handle. And I remember Dana came up to me and gave me a big hug. And just from the beginning, just I felt so at home. I just felt so comfortable. And I loved the how much thorough preparation he brought to the entire concert. It was a um, Handel and Purcell summer fireworks concert. Mm. So a lot of fiery repertoire. And then on the Purcell side, more contemplative repertoire. So we did this whole range, a lot of different tone colors in there. And I just loved the finesse with which Dana handled each of those shadings. And also this wonderful equilibrium that's special to find in a director where they bring so much preparation to the table and they also give you all this room to breathe and mm -hmm. express yourself. I just felt, I felt at my most comfortable and uh, I, that was a really special thing. I loved it. So speaking of data, this is provides the, the, the perfect segue into the fact that you are, you know, as I mentioned in my intro, the, the fact that you will be joining uh, the Washington Bot Concert on Sunday, April the 21st in Heightened Creation. And this is your debut with the concert. It is. It is. I'm so excited. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm really excited and I'm honored. I mean, this lineup of musicians, Patrick, every singer in the bot consort, every player is just superlative, like to a person. It's just, it's, I know it's gonna be such a delight. I'm really excited to do this with Tom Cooley and with Edmund Milley, who is a dear friend. And I just, I have really loved working on these arias. I have loved living with the piece. I've loved um, envisioning the whole emotional arc of the piece. It's this kind of like um, rhapsodic song in praise of the natural world, you know, how the whole natural world resounds with praise and beauty and love. And the, mm. that's how each of us is, is reborn, right? When we live through the peace, hopefully in hearing the peace, is that there's this like visceral sense of joy and gratitude at every living thing, you know, every mm. little bud, every little tree, and the way in which we can find each other and connection in the natural world. And I just think it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I hope to bring, you know, my my deepest self to it. Mm. Well, you know, one of my favorite soprano arias in that piece is the one, the marvelous, yeah, that, that octave show. I love that. Oh, and it's so much fun. fun. <laughs> and then, of course, you can't talk about Heights creation with not mentioning the heavens are telling, that big, mm. you know, buoyant uh, uh, a chorus. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned your 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 uh, colleagues, uh, Emma Milley and Thomas Cooley, who I have heard both of them. Oh, my goodness. This, this is going to be a tour de force as far as a trio of soloists. And, <laughs> um, but this brings me to my next point about the consort. Something mm -hmm. uh, that I really admire about Dana is the level of diversity that he has brought you know, to the consort. And, and um, I think he's continuing also a legacy of the late J. Riley Lewis because uh, like J. Riley Lewis and now with Dana, it is so wonderful to see artists of color in the orchestra and not to diminish singers uh but oftentimes people will have the expectation oh you might have you know a little bit more diversity in the the course but to see you know pat neely over there or to see uh wade davis, wade davis yeah. you know just all throughout the the orchestra it is such um a treat and mm -hmm. that makes me uh, to a, another point. So, you know, I guess it was about eight years ago that I did this piece for Early Music America. It was called That's right. Presence Revisited. Yes, Daryl Taylor and Pat Neely. 
Yes, yes, and mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, Derek Lee Reagan, if I'm not mistaken, I cited him mm -hmm. in there among others. But it is just um, wonderful to see um, artists of color represent in early music. So mm -hmm. I know I, I know we keep saying yes. that word early. We, we do, we do. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I have lots of I have lots of thoughts about. It. I can I piggyback on your what you said about the, yeah. the consort. I think it's so powerful, Patrick. It's so powerful. And you know what I found is that there are directors who are very much about this work of inclusion. And I find that there's a little bit of a common theme, and that is that they're not they're not loud about it. They they don't brag about it. They're they're not they're not posting fancy PR about diversity they are actually diversifying you know mm -hmm. about the work of integrating over time artists of color into the fold such that we can feel a deeper and deeper sense of belonging in the world of early music and that is profound and I, I have just found to to a leader that the ones who are really really serious about the work are not out there tooting their own horn about it they're just doing the work Mm -hmm. And I, I admire that so much about Dana and about the consort as a whole. I'm going to try this uh, again to see, can I get a clip? Because I know the people want to hear you. <laughs> you okay, you I'll, all I'll, just, I'll mute myself. <laughs> you all just, oh, so you don't laugh? Hold on a second. Let's see. Um, all right. Second time's a charm. Yeah, I hope so. Let's see. We go share. Uh, Oh, did I, am I, I'm not, mm, let's see, I don't want to share my, hold on, let's see, can we do this? I had to stop sharing, I was sharing my, my email thread with you, let's see. You sharing your business? <laughs> uh, um, let's see. Okay. Okay, this might work now. If you all just bear with me, I'm so sorry. We are just, here we go. Okay, this might work now. If you see someone experiencing a drug or alcohol overdose, don't run. Call 911. Maryland's Good Samaritan Law protects you if you stay in help. You cannot be legally arrested, charged, or prosecuted for using drugs or for simple possession. And the law protects the person overdosing too. The law won't protect you if you witness the emergency and you don't help. So make the call. For more information, visit stopoverdose.maryland.gov or call or text now. Now. There we go. Hopefully. Oh, morning. How'd you sleep? Oh gosh. Amazing. Oh, no. Amazing. It's giving oh, us sound cloud. Why? Why all the ads? Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, at least the people got got comic relief. So I <laughs> guess that's true. Our, uh, hopefully uh, we come back to something. But anyway, if you all get a chance, it's a clip. Maybe I can post it in another fashion, but it's Let the Bright Sarah film. And uh, the reason I wanted to play that example is the fact that how it really exemplifies um the flexibility and just the nuance that uh, Michelle brings to this Baroque music. So at oh, any rate, you. oh, of course. So I guess, I, I, you know, I, I was so afraid to try to share anything now. So I'll just try to, you know, <laughs> my person, the conversation. So we, you and I were talking kind of informally uh, before we, you know, really went live just about the fact, you know, since we're on the same um, breath of, you know, early music, and I want to, you know, bring up, you know, our conversation for the audience, and that's what you and I were talking about, the Monte Verde, and mm -hmm. I was sharing with you when I got to hear you and Matthew Robertson in 13, and, you know, first of all, that is a glorious work. I'll, I'll let you mm -hmm. all in on a secret. Uh, back in the day, there used to be this CD club. Uh, it wasn't Columbia Records or anything like that. I forgot the, oh, it was called H. Um, it was called H and something direct. But anyway, they had a contest where if you got, if you wrote a review of a CD, they would send you the CD, you know, oh, you know, as a nice. and I was like, in, I want to say in high school. 
And I wrote this review of the Monte Verde Vespers, and it was conducted by Sir John Elliott Gardner. I'll never forget that in the Monte Verde Choir. And so that work has always stuck in my head. I, I, I'm thinking about like, the, you know, when you're in music history, like in college, you hear these terms like chorus bizzati and uh, get, you know, the whole idea of like the, the gallery choirs and the antipodal sound and all that stuff. But anyway, so mm -hmm. it hard to be back to that. And so when I came to that concert that you uh, were in, you know, featured in with the 13, mm -hmm. I, as I share with you, the thing that stuck out to me is when you sang the solo work, Negra Soon. Could you kind of talk to the audience about that, why I would bring that up and how that embodied mm -hmm. uh, your, your place in early music as a woman of color or a black uh, biracial woman of color. Yes, absolutely. Uh, a little background to contextualize why this piece was so powerful for me to perform. And that is that I think when I entered the field, Patrick, as a young adult, I think I and a lot of my peers, we sort of just take for granted that a lot of the norms of the field are just set right? Like they just are what they are. And we don't really understand yet that we have a lot of power to influence them. So when I moved to New York City in my early 20s, uh, the early music world was, was bustling then as it is now. But I think there was still this prevailing aesthetic for high voices, especially sopranos, that was very much kind of like a one color, pretty straight tone sound, and uh, kind of like, I don't want to say a disembodied sound, a light sound. A light sound, a floaty sound, right? Not a full lyric sound, a very light sound. And because I was able to produce that sound easily, I got hired to do a lot of work that had that kind of aesthetic, right? Nothing wrong with that. I'm building my career, getting work is good, right? But I started to understand as I got older that not only was that sound world just one facet of my voice and also not very much of my voice, but <laughs> just a small, maybe like 10 or 15% of my voice. <laughs> but I started to understand that there were other folks in the early music world who were saying, you know, maybe there's a wider range of sounds, a wider range of aesthetics that we could start welcoming into this space, right? And I actually think this is a very key and multi-layered question that many among us, and I, I wanna um, give a shout out to Early Music America and especially David McCormick, because I think there's a lot of leadership there among the board and a lot of visible folks um, who are who are at, at work changing this. These, these, these preconceptions about who and what is welcome on the stage and expanding the notion of what early music can mean, right? It doesn't mean any one thing. Early music is in fact, the intersection of historic narratives that make up our, the soundscape, right? The musical soundscape of our background. So here in the States, certainly early music includes music of, of Western Europe, of course, which is usually the sort of default definition, but also we've got, we've got indigenous music, we've got black American music, we've got immigrants music from all over the globe, right? We've got work songs, hymns, spirituals, native folk tunes, it's like that whole intersection. It couldn't even be more diverse. That's, that's what America is, right? A nation of immigrants. And I feel like the early music world is slowly but surely beginning to evolve to this place where there are many, many more sounds welcome to the table. So this brings me to this place. So, so Matthew Robertson from the 13, this is now about two years ago, he reaches out to me, heard wonderful things about your singing. I would love for you to come to the Monteverdi Vespers with us. Now, one other important point is that in the Monteverdi Vespers, one of the most beloved masterworks of the Baroque period, the Negro Sum is the only solo. There are many, many, many duets and trios and featured moments, but the Negro Sum is a standalone solo from the Song of Songs, right? I am black and beautiful. This mm -hmm. wonderful, sensuous text. It is almost always performed by a tenor. And you know what, Patrick, because of the way that early music functions, it's almost always performed by a white tenor, mm -hmm. right? And there's nothing wrong with that. It can be performed so beautifully by, by tenor. But it was um, a little bit of a radical thing for Matthew to say, would you like to sing that aria? And to his credit, I, I felt so um, equal partner at the table. He, we talked about it. There was a lot of space. How do you feel about this? 
do you feel comfortable singing it? Would you like to write some program notes? Would you like to speak about it? He was very open. I think he wanted me to feel comfortable, which I very much appreciated. And when the time came, we had this wonderful performance run. So many beloved colleagues, part of that. Molly Quinn. Yeah. I remember you and Molly Quinn and I in our group hug. It was so great. <laughs> and I just felt so, I felt so celebrated. I really did, Patrick. And I think that for me to go up there as a black woman and sing, I am black and beautiful and kind of reclaim this song of songs text, which is so evocative and sensual and embodied. And for me to bring my full lyric voice to that, not the little floaty, tiny 10, 15% of my voice, but the full lyric instrument for me was like a sea change. I was like, this is how I wanna be in the world of early music, right? It's like my whole voice, my whole self, my whole identity. I'm done, I'm done using 10% of myself. I'm ready to bring my entire self. <laughs> you know, that is wonderful to hear you say that because I know, I mean, to be honest, like when I first was exposed to, you know, quote unquote early music, especially when you talk about sopranos and I'm not knocking this person, I think they have a beautiful voice, but the standard that I always had when I was thinking about early music was the legendary soprano Emma Kirkby. Mm -hmm. I would always mm -hmm. hear that very straight, beautiful, yes. but just so beautiful. pinpoint precise. So yes. now, now we're in this space where you hear, you know, singers like Sonia Hedlum, or you hear um, Elizabeth uh, Llewellyn, uh, you know, and now you have, you know, Rex Mobley, you know, you, you, you have these, these voices that you, they have a body, but they still are in the integrity of this space that we, you know, call early music. So mm -hmm. I'm just yes. overjoyed, you know, that it's this this diversity that we, you know, none none other than like we've seen. Um, yes, yes, before. it's so true. And I, I love also how you say that it's very possible to honor, you know, Baroque gesture, Renaissance gesture, any any historic period gesture using a full lyric instrument. The thing is, you know, we, we work hard so that we have mastery over the range of colors in our voice. And that means, as my current voice teacher would say, you can access the silvery floaty place, but let's just make that one tool in your toolbox, not your default aesthetic for everything, right? Which feels very different because one of them is, I feel like I have agency over this sound. I'm choosing the sound. And one of them is I feel I feel sort of controlled by this sound, which is not not very healthy, not very sustainable. So I think that having more and more Sonia and Reggie, of course, leaders in the field, glorious artists, both of them, and such intelligent, um, wonderfully panoramic thinkers when it comes to these questions. And I think this is the stuff, Patrick, this is the stuff. And to be really real with you, so like, let's, let's, let's take this apart a little bit. Okay. So this prevailing aesthetic, especially for women's voices, if you have this like straight tone, high floaty voice, there are, there are very few grown female bodied people who produce that sound, right? There are, there are some, but for most, like, who is it that's going to make that sound? A young woman, a thin woman, and chances are higher, a white woman. Just biologically speaking, right? We're going to, like, if you have black and brown folks coming to sing, there's going to be color in the voice, right? And I do think that this shift in aesthetic, and I'm being a little reductionist, but we're all friends at the table here, right? So it's like questioning our defaults is so healthy for everybody, right? There's this unlearning that has to happen. Like, oh, we assume that it had to be rigid and like this, but no, no, this is like living, breathing music. It needs everybody's full body. And what's so exciting about it, and I love how they celebrate this at the 13 at Washington Bach, that every color is different, right? And so we find a wonderful unity that brings everybody's full sound to the table, but the diversity of the instruments is part of the beauty. Right. Mm -hmm. And I also love how this is this is manifest in Haydn's creation is everything from uh, the heavens are telling, as you said, this glorious chorus, full forces, full throated everybody. Right. To these like really intimate recits, beautiful duets, beautiful arias that are like the innermost world, you know, the in one's intimate relationship with nature. 
and with what it means to love each other and everything in between, right? Full orchestra. I just think all those colors are so exciting and they need everybody's particular voice at the table. <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna come behind it. You, you are exactly right. Just think about your you're singing this work that embodies the full spectrum, you know, of creation, and and that includes everyone. That that was beautifully said. Now let's get to agave. Oh yes, excellent. You know, <laughs> first of all, I want to thank you again. You know. It, it you know you 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 remain like one of the few people who who reach out and send me something you know directly and I really appreciated your lovely note. So when I got <laughs> the recording, you know, I listened to it from start to finish, and I know you know most of the time people think they, they you or they will want um a review, and I and I saw your your reviews that you got, which I'm excited. I just had to take it all in because when I listened to this recording. I was telling somebody about it. I said, it's like they have taken in a beautiful way, organized these works by uh, Black composers, you know, the spirituals, but it was almost like many cantatas to me with mm. the different instruments. And it was like somebody who maybe they only listened to like leader or chamber music. They would pick up this CD and be like, hmm. <laughs> Chamber music, we ought to get a little twist to it. Yes, it does. Yes, it so, does. So, and I want to, and I want to shout out to Jeffrey Silva and Asus because you know it's so funny. I'm going to tell you how small the world is. So, Jeffrey, I hadn't seen in a while since his days uh, with you know with the Washington Chorus, and I mean that's been many years ago. But come to find out, his, his former church where he was at is like near my job now. So we actually had a chance meeting. So it was good to see him. Um, oh, I love that. I know his, his many projects that he's done and his label, mm -hmm. Aces Production, just the diversity that that represents, you know, from, you know, Rex Mobley's project to your project to Trevor Weston's project. Yes. Go on and on well, and on. Trevor, well, Trevor and the Washington Bach together. Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's yes. so exciting. It's true. I'm also going to record a, a new album. Oh, is that a, is that an exclusive it's, for me? That's an exclusive. Details oh details will be coming. Okay, <laughs> but, uh, but I I love I love working with Jeffrey Patrick. He also recorded our Monteverdi Vespers with the thirteen. Oh my goodness, yes. And that was that was wonderful. That was just about six months before the Agave album. So he and I got to see a lot of each other that fall of twenty twenty two, and I think actually what you're saying about the vignettes chamber music vignettes uh, is very much Agave's wheelhouse. And I think also questioning what that means mm -hmm. is, is a forte of everybody in Agave, Henry Lebedinsky, Aaron Westman, Anna Washburn, Bill Skeen, Katie Kine. I got to give them all a shout out. Kevin Cooper. Uh -oh. I think, I think that they, Michelle, they... Oh, did oh, I break up? I froze. Am I yeah. back? Oh, good. <laughs> technology. <laughs> I think that part of what Agave loves to do is ask these very questions, actually, that we're asking is because Agave was Agave Baroque for a mm. long time, and they changed their name to Agave. Why? I, I think each of them would have a different thing to say about that. But I think essentially, they wanted to say, well, yes, we are early music specialists, but also we're going to do contemporary music, we're going to do 20th, 20th, 21st century art song, as we have, you know, the Florence Price selections, the Margaret Bond selections on the album, we have Pauline Viardot, uh, we have, you know, this range. And Agave is very much about these dialogues between early music selections and more contemporary ones, and also the bridges that that forges and the different voices that it welcomes to the table. So I think uh, this album is a wonderful showcase of what that diversity can do when it's thoughtfully stitched together. So how did the album come to be that you would co collaborate with such a um, a group such as Agave? Because it, it is such a fascinating um, collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. You know what, Patrick? It was um, two months exactly after my daughter was born that they they asked me to join them in solo recital two months to the day 
after I had given birth. <laughs> Needless to say, this was sooner than I expected to be performing, <laughs> like by by many months, especially a solo recital. But I remember I called my voice teacher the day that I got this email from Agave, and I said, um, "Julia, this project is so wonderful, and I know that I just gave birth to our daughter, <laughs> but I also feel like this is a dream come true kind of program." this in her hands. It was like an early seedling of what the album has become. And I said, you know, just female powerhouses from over the ages, some of my favorite repertoire, some repertoire that's new to me and it's so thoughtfully curated and it's all these amazing players. I said, I feel like I need to do this. So we did it, we did it. We performed at the Berkeley Museum. It was September, 2021. So very tentative, you know, everybody was still wearing masks one of the first concerts after the pandemic, but that was the beginning, Patrick. Yeah, I just felt like I was with family, with Agave in a word, you know, their family, their family. And so we've created this recital program that we performed various times together and that became the album and we're still performing it all the time, which is a total joy for me. Oh, I lost your audio. Oh, that's me. There we go. Hey, there you are. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I was trying to be slick. I was in the background saying, you know, I muted so I could try to get this clip up. I'm trying to get the clip, yes. But, but oh my goodness, I know this is going to blare, but the recording, you all must get the recording. And if, and if you must, uh, it's also... Um, if you go, oh yeah, there you go. So this is amazing. <laughs> so I want to take a moment to definitely lift up one of our pioneers who is on this recording. And I think I can share successfully this uh, selection by Florence Price. Wonderful. And let me, you all just bear with me. I think, I think, oh, I think this is it. I think we're going to be successful. In your face I sometimes see Shadowings of the man to be such a special woman happy heavenly birthday yesterday Florence yes indeed. happy birthday Florence <laughs> oh my goodness and, and that, I, that piece I, oh. the birth of your daughter and then that particular piece that is oh my goodness that is so poignant so beautiful thank oh. you so much for sending me that clip I oh, you know my audience I just regret the fact that you know I had such a snafu because you know it, it, Michelle sent me some beautiful things. So this is going to be my plug for myself. So I need me an intern across the <laughs> need an intern. So if you're interested in you can get background and share stuff, but I didn't <laughs> do that, I'm just going to put that out there. But Michelle, um, before we wrap up, because I know that it's, it's still quite kind of early there for you all um, yes. in California. Um, 
as you know, we we wrap up. What would you say to somebody who was um, maybe considering pursuing uh, this kind of niche area of music? Hmm. I would say uh, send me an email. <laughs> Re reach out reach out to people and I mean this Patrick because for me and I think for all of us my, without my mentors I would be I would be nowhere I'd be nowhere I needed my mentors in the girls chorus I needed my mentors at Yale I needed my mentors in early adulthood I need my mentors now and I think that the more people you can talk to I would encourage people to reach out to early music America also because early music America has these great scholarship programs uh, you need to just have your materials in order and you can apply and start getting some seed grants start doing a little bit of research figure out what kind of repertoire you love the most and then spend some time with it. Um, the other thing I would say, and I think that this is true in any musical discipline, um, devote, devote as much time to the technical preparation as you do to the emotional preparation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this, this is a big learning for me, Patrick. Um, I think that we spend so many hours honing our craft as well we should, right? Well this this is a very this is this is an act of fitness muscular fitness muscular refinement it takes everyday practice and i just find the more that i do this as a career the more i'm psycho emotionally invested and the mm. more that i make these you know signposts and the pieces that i sing what does this mean to me florence price is to my little son this is this is for me about new motherhood this is about my love for my daughter this is this amazing jazz classical fusion that she's written, right? This little bonbon, it's just genius. And each piece you take, what's personal about it? You know, Gabriel from the creation has this beautiful sense of wonder and sort of elegance about the national, the natural world. How, what does that mean? How does that feel to me? How can I bring my real heart, my real conviction to the work? I think that those would be my main points of advice. Great mentorship, reach out to Early Music America, and be in the work head and heart. Mm. I know I said I was going to wrap up, but you said something. Two things jumped out at me. <laughs> you mentioned um, the technical aspect and then the preparation. So I think that's important, especially in, in early music because you know a lot of times people when they for, for instance if they're doing like a da capo aria and mm -hmm. then and so for those who, who are lay people just listening you know the, the, let's say this is a and a is basically like the beginning of the piece but mm -hmm. b in the middle is like you know peanut butter and jelly and <laughs> you go back to the other piece of bread <laughs> But you've added something special. And sometimes I think that when it comes to like ornamentation, people just think, oh, it happens or has no mm. thought to it. So talk to me about your process. Do you write all your ornaments in or do you have people who maybe suggest ornaments or do you listen to ornaments that someone else has done? How does that process mm. work in early music or baroque music in particular? Sure, sure. I I use all three of those <laughs> in, to different degrees. Um, Sometimes I write in ornaments. It can help me, especially if it's like a cadenza. And if I want to get it in my muscle, I want to memorize it. It kind of helps me visually to like um, plant it in my brain and my muscles over time. But also sometimes I find Patrick, um, because I do so much music making by rote, that's uh, most of us classical musicians, we read music, right? Um, it can be really nice to be off book about it and mm. just trust my instinct but I do, I love what you said about um, how ornaments aren't just something that you insert because you're singing the thing again, <laughs> right? That's, <laughs> why would you do that? I feel like you've been, the B section is meant in, in an ABA aria, the B section is meant to take you somewhere different, take you on a different journey. And therefore, by the time you get back to the A section again, you are changed. You are not the same person. And I feel like it's part of, there are responsibility to communicate that transformation. It's like, I started out in a place and I went through a human thing and I am changed and I just have to tell you about it. And I'm that much more excited about it, hence my ornaments. <laughs> I 
because of everything I've been through. Mm. Well, thank you so much for for going backwards for me because yeah, when you when you mentioned that because you know, and to be honest, when you said just now, see, you're gonna make me keep talking when you mentioned the whole idea. Of, I love it. Of, I love it. I'm singing by rote or you know that kind of thing. That took me back to the basic element of the church, especially the black church, because you know a lot of times when you uh, hear hymns in the church, the person might you know sing a line to him or just the, the the regular melody but then by that time that thing gets to the end it's all kinds of turns and roulades and 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 everything so it, I'm, I'm saying all that to say in many ways that this music sometimes people think is different is very much alike it's very much alike you know, because some of the same principles, you might call it an ornamentation, but somebody here might call it a riff or a mm -hmm. run, you know, mm -hmm. so, so it's interesting. Yes. So, well, and it's a blurry line too. Isn't it a blurry line? <laughs> right. And and it, it, and it's more exciting because it's a blurry line, right? If I'm going to, if I'm going to draw from R&B, if I'm going to draw from gospel, if I'm going to draw from classical training, all of the above, right? They cross pollinate. That's the thing. And this is also, I feel like it echoes the earlier part of our conversation about what is early music, especially in the United States, right? Is this cross-pollination of styles. And that is absolutely to be celebrated. Like, I think it's it's just a false myth. It's a very capitalist myth that we live in these little silos and that everything is separate. But no, you know, singing Messiah, you gotta like feel the backbeats. This is jazz, it's jazz. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michelle, it has been an absolute joy to talk to you. I mean, and the thing that I enjoy, I mean, we know one another. So it's like, this is like a natural, uh, authentic, you know, conversation. And I want to appreciate, I just, I want to, I appreciate you for being here. And, and just um, in closing, I do want to give the details. We're so excited that um, Michelle took time out of her schedule to speak to me uh, you know, ahead of her appearance with the Washington Bach Consort on Sunday, uh, April the 21st at 4 o'clock p.m. at the National Presbyterian Church here in Washington, D.C., uh, under the direction of Dana Marsh. And I can't say enough about Dana. So let me just give 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 uh, my friend his, his, his props, as we like to say. So as you know, J. Riley Lewis, he was the you know, the revered founder of the Washington Bach Consort. And um, when he passed, it was, I guess people didn't know which direction, you know, the concert was going to go as far as the director. And of course, they interviewed um, several candidates. But I will never forget when Dana Marsh conducted, if I'm not mistaken, it was the Christmas Oratorio was his, his debut. And I just remember that whole place just erupted. Oh, you and, and it, you know that's why I hate. I I should have should have written some things down. You know it was Bach. How about that? But whatever you know it was, <laughs> <laughs> the place just erupted. And oh, I love it. Yeah, and everybody that is just so beautiful. He was, he I was love the that. Director, so I am so excited that you're going to be joining the Washington Bach Consort in this performance of high creation. And um, do you have any final thoughts? Do you want to give any final shout outs before we sign off? <laughs> it, is, it is a total honor for me to join Washington Bach for this project. I'm so excited about it. And I can't wait to see you in person, Patrick. It's gonna be so nice. All the dimensions, you know, I can give you a real hug. Um, <laughs> and you're reminding me of Let the Bright Seraphim. If you like, I have it here. And it could be our it could be our send out. And I also, I promise to send you a link and we okay. can share it later. Okay, so so can I give you sharing rights? Sure. It looks like I have them already. Okay. If I just share my share screen. Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, ooh, share screen. Ooh, yes. Could you give me the the sharing right? Yes. Let's see. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Where is the? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna make you a. 
Let's see. Okay. Co-host. You make me host. That'll work. Oh, beautiful. Right. Okay. I think. So let the bright seraphim handle. Let the bright seraphim know this is um this is the da capo. Excellent. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Uh oh, did you share the sound? Michelle, you need to share the sound. <laughs> oh. Did you see, click the box? Oh. <laughs> see, I told you it's not just you. I'm screen sharing. <laughs> Is it working? No, you may, let's see. Um, is this something I have to do on my end? Let's see. This will stop. Let me let me stop your share. <laughs> well, we can't say we didn't try, Patrick. We did try. We did try. <laughs> we tried. And see. you know what? Why don't why don't I I will share it in a different format so we can send it to folks after the fact. Okay, yeah, let's let's do that. All right, Beautiful. So. Well, I can't tell you how much it, this is, it means oh. to me, this um, this conversation with you and the warm greeting to this project in D.C. I, I'm just so excited about it. Thank you for taking yeah. the time. Well, how come your screen is still here? I don't Did know. You click, did you click? There we there go. We go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're both old fashioned. That's kind of oh, it's oh, actually very comforting. <laughs> but that's okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation with acclaimed soprano Michelle Kennedy. I am Patrick D. Bacoy, and you have been watching and listening to Across the Arts, and I hope that you will share this broadcast far and wide. Again, we are delighted that Michelle will be returning to the D.C. area, where she will be featured in her debut with the Washington Bach Consort in Heighton's Great Oratorio, The Creation, with the Washington Bach Consort and Dana Marsh. It's going to be a wonderful performance, so I hope that you all will join me uh, next Sunday at the National Presbyterian Church here in Washington, D.C. for that wonderful performance. Again, I am your host, Patrick D. McCoy, and we thank you so much for joining us. And again, make sure that you get agave in her hands. And I'm so sorry that I couldn't play uh, the final uh, selection. She's got the whole world in her hands. Uh, but at any rate, I hope that you all will uh, seek out the recording. I'll put the link uh, in the uh, chat so you can uh, go back to that. Again, thank you all so much and have a good day. Hang on for a moment. Um